Good artists copy, great artists steal, is a phrase attributed to Steve Jobs that he attributed to Pablo Picasso that has no evidence of ever being said by Pablo Picasso. This quote probably began in 1892 from an author named W. H. Davenport Adams in a magazine article praising the poet Alfred Tennyson, who he admitted adopts an image or a suggestion from a predecessor and works it up into his own glittering fabric. Later, he's coining the canon that great poets imitate and improve or as small ones steal and spoil. So after a century of other writers stealing that quote and citing other writers who stole that quote, we have the version we know today. Even though the words are kind of in the opposite order, I mean, hey, it means pretty much the same thing. Which brings us to a bit of great art that shamelessly flaunts just how much stealing it does. Salt and Sanctuary is a side-scrolling platformer brawler RPG whose inspiration can be spotted in seconds. In the case of Ska Studios, their predecessor is Dark Souls, and their own glittering fabric is this gothed up gorilla's art style and 2D combat system that they've been developing with the Dishwasher, Charlie Murder, and this game that had zombies in it. But for this one, their focus is clearly aimed at Dark Souls, and by proxy, the lineage of predecessors that influence Dark Souls itself. After all, there's not much truly original in media. Pick any favorite among any medium, start digging, and you're likely to find countless stolen elements from other mediums. And what some may consider a tragic fact of reality is that all that really matters at the end of the day is whether or not that media is any good or not. And fortunately, Salt and Sanctuary passes that test. It's not just a smooth and elegant demake of Dark Souls into 2D, it's also, and perhaps by virtue of taking that route, a damn fine Metroidvania that could have stood on its own anyway. In fact, if more people start playing it, it might actually set a new standard for this whole genre. But like I said, Dark Souls is the primary focus here, and Salt translates almost every core mechanic of solo Souls play. You've got slightly altered versions of bonfires, retrievals, attribute scalings, the covenants, and even the parry and... Repost. Repost. It's got fog gates, fatty rolls, funny multiplayer messages, and a torch timer system that's just one slight rule change away from exactly how that works in DS2. Some of the bosses and some of the levels bear a resemblance that is more than striking. It's uncanny. It's barely enough to avoid a lawsuit and perhaps more than enough to remain endearing. But the irony of all that is that it's just good. Going from playing Bloodborne a couple weeks earlier to this one felt like transitioning from any one real Souls game to another real Souls game. Its two-person indie team means it's lacking in their spectacle, but there is an almost from software level of depth to the whole experience regardless. So what's different? Well, you level onto a sphere grid. Thankfully, and cleverly, you can refund old points you've planted down these paths to work your way around the developer's intended specialization and steer towards your own customization. Bonfires are customizable with your own choice of shops and fast travel services, which also fold into this game's version of Covenants. Your chosen religion, and how well you stick to it, determines what buffing and healing gear each bonfire restocks you with, and how well you're treated at bonfires belonging to the other creeds. But the most fundamental core cipher of this whole translation effort was the combat system. On the surface, it might look as derivative as everything else, but underneath the hood, it's actually a fairly different beast. For starters, you got much more of a combo list here. You can combine your chargeable light and heavy attacks into this DMC launcher that makes it possible to juggle enemies. Plus, you got a respectable handful of hidden combos and advanced jumping moves to learn. And the switch to 2D makes for a player character who's more responsive, vertically viable, and quicker than most anyone was in Dark Souls. Meaning Salt and Sanctuary might actually appeal to a different audience of people who don't like slow Souls combat. Although gameplay does move a whole lot faster, every swing still requires that lengthy wind-up and cooldown, plus a hearty step forward, plus a deep, nasty, hard and heavy hit. It's slightly easier than the average Souls game, but that still means it's pretty damn hard by your average video game standards. Which has always been kind of the point. Paying attention to smithing, alchemy, and its leveling systems had me rolling at a crisp pace through most of the mid-game, but that wasn't without nice moments of challenge and a general need for alertness everywhere. This game was not without a sense of threat lurking behind the darkness and what ample oppressive darkness there was. 
It wasn't without an incredible amount of intensity to exploring new areas. Rarely do I ever just concentrate on a game as hard as I do with these. It still has that incredible payoff of landing a slow motion final strike on a tough boss, of min-maxing out the perfect character build, and that trembling, anxious mix of fear and curiosity as you venture deeper into a dungeon, risking more precious upgrade currency as you go. Just as in Dark Souls, you'll be going slow. You'll peruse architecture details and look forward to flavor text. You'll scan new rooms for booby traps via torchlight. You'll juggle risk and reward to overcome impossible challenges, and you'll feel depressed, embarrassed, amazed, and elated at the highs and lows of that learning process. And that is why it nails what was good about Dark Souls. I don't necessarily like it for being a cold mechanical translation of the rules of Dark Souls, I like it for understanding why Dark Souls was so great in the first place. It nails the pacing, the flow, and really the emotional appeal of playing that type of game. It nails the stuff that's abstract and hard to put down on paper, the qualities that its competitors might have a harder time figuring out. And a lot of that is down to raw level design, which might have been the most elegant process of this translation. Flattening up a map of interconnected honeycomb tunnels into interconnected vertical honeycomb shafts distills Dark Souls into the slower, heavier Igavania spin-off that it really always was. Which is why, if you want to get technical, Sultan Sanctuary is really just as much a rip on Castlevania as it is Dark Souls. And maybe actually, it's the glue between the two. It's Symphony of the Night with slow combat, lengthy lonely quiet time, no map screen, and enemies who are a legitimate threat. And believe it or not, the team did all of that with a healthy amount of content too. So much so that I wouldn't be surprised if it's making Koji Igarashi's own Bloodstained team get a little nervous. Across the first 20 hour playthrough, I couldn't believe the diversity of enemies and areas and abilities and gear that this game covers. The levels start with gritty stop and roll brawling and work their way up to precarious platforming challenges that have you reaching beyond the furthest tip of the sky. My first character was an attempt at an easy mode, all strength and enough carry load for heavy armor and huge hammers. Second playthrough was me trying to get a little more interesting doing a lightweight Bloodborne Hunter. And for both runs, which were both a hell of a good time, I saw two entirely different dimensions to the combat system, enemy AI, and even to the player's own sense of movement and positioning. And now I'm rolling them both into new game pluses for more. There's this whole big magic system and micromanagement you can do with the religions and local co-op, and I have barely even scratched the surface of those features after two full playthroughs. So yeah, if you haven't guessed it by now, I am pretty darn happy with how this game turned out, even if it is familiar territory. For that matter, entering into a trend of Souls clones may be nice too. I'd much rather spend the summer playing clones of Dark Souls than more Ubisoft collectathons. Salt and Sanctuary may be derivative, but the positive side of that fact is that it is just good at deriving. Unfortunately, it is not absolutely perfectly perfect. The unoriginality of it all is going to turn off some people, and like I said earlier, it's lacking the sheer spectacle of Souls bosses as well as the polish of a bigger team and budget. The problem of a 3D camera's lock-on system going nuts trying to track a big ol' boss is, in 2D, the big ol' boss simply cornering you onto one side of the screen. And another interesting quirk of the whole concept of this project is that there's no map screen. Dark Souls didn't have a map screen, but it was a hell of a lot harder to get lost in 3D than it is in 2D. I'd also be interested in seeing what this game's PS4 exclusivity period did to its budget. It's certainly much, much larger than most other small team indie games, but that just makes the areas they had to skimp out on stick out more. Like music, bosses, and the occasional exploration track just kind of repeat the same three seconds of chords over and over again. The art style looks underdeveloped in a lot of places, faces have creepy proportions, and a lot of background layers are suffering a detailed drought. It doesn't mean that it's not a good-looking game, though. Atmosphere here matters more than fidelity. But for all these complaints, the developers' assets were focused squarely on where they needed to be. On the level design, the combat design, depth and scope of its content, and the sheer quality of the player's experience rummaging through it all. It may be a case of quality over creativity, but hey, I'm not complaining. 
If you care a bit about Dark Souls, about Castlevania, about Metroid, or about just damn fine video games in general, this one deserves your time. And the price is certainly not an issue. Sure, it's an interesting intersection of Dark Souls and Castlevania. It's a demake, it's an experiment, and a totally shameless homage. But what makes all that okay is that despite their liberal borrowing, the final product they put out at the end of the day turned out pretty damn good anyway.